Hi, everyone. I'm Vlad Smishkevich of Hipster, Historically Informed Performance Series, Teaching, Education, and Research, coming to you from our own little uh, corner of Ireland here, where we are at home. And we have just enjoyed a wonderful Hi everyone. hour that was not to, too long ago in uh, right here on our online presence for Hipster. We had a wonderful assortment of early music artists and practitioners who came in to talk about what brought them to early music and all manner of other things that we tend to talk shop about as uh, performers and uh, scholarly performers, researchers, etc. And we're going to resume now in our meeting here, our second session, question and answer of early music artists. I'm going to be bringing in a few of my colleagues here into the conference. Uh, for all of you who are listening online, just to let you know, we are here online live streaming with some of our colleagues and We've been able to connect now through YouTube. Uh, I'd like to welcome into our uh, chat room now two of our friends who were with us earlier, uh, Maliki Robinson, uh, Viola da Gamba, and uh, bass file, bass uh, player, as well as Andrew Lawrence King, historical harpist and director. And uh, all of them, very uh, happy to see you again after our first session here, also bringing Katrina O'Mahony, director of the East Cork Early Music Festival, into the, uh, into the chat room and welcoming Katrina in now. Uh, we've been able to hook up to YouTube Live and that's going out on our webpage, hipsterisland.com. And also, if all is working correctly, we also have it on our uh, Facebook page, but if you can't, uh, find it there, just go to hipsterireland.com and also to YouTube, look for the, uh, look for the session that says um, Volodymyr Smishkevich, if you can manage to spell my name. Um, anyhow, that'll all be forwarded through RIMA, the European Early Music Network. Welcome folks, welcome back for our second session. Andrew, Katrina and Maliki, thanks for coming back to uh, talk to us. Great to be with you again. Hey there. Thanks, Lars. Hi. Hello again. Um, so we may have some of our other friends and colleagues joining us again in this second session here. But I thought now that we have people who are listening in to us and uh, finding out what it's like to, to talk to some of uh, the artists in the early music world, we can hopefully get to, um, to hear from you who make music uh, all day, all year, now that we're stuck at home, to think about a few things, a few musings. We left our first session thinking about early music education and pedagogy. And um, I thought I'd start the ball rolling with um, one of our, uh, and if you don't mind me, uh, I won't be divulging ages here, obviously, that would be rather uncouth of me, but one of the younger members, younger generations of the, uh, of the group here, Katrina, um, who, in this last decade and a half, I'd say you've entered into the early music world. Would that be accurate? Uh, uh, yeah, I'd say so. <laughs> okay. The reason I'm asking the question is because I'd like to hear from you your thoughts about early music um, education and the way that you came into early music. We were talking about that a little bit earlier on. And what was your experience like coming into early music and education for early music, the pedagogy about it, um, and what would you do differently for people who come after you? Um, uh, yeah, I think, um, I, I suppose there are a number of ways of thinking about that. So as I say, I started uh, playing, um, started studying with, uh, with Maria Gaynor in, in Cork, um, and I um, was very lucky in, in, in that situation. I was quite interested in, in what Miriam said earlier that, uh, uh, that she, um, Teresa had said as well, actually, that you just learn so much from your colleagues uh, uh, rather than exclusively your teachers. I, I've had some really wonderful teachers, but I think probably 
practically the best way to learn is always from playing with with other people so I was very fortunate in Cork that besides I mean taking lessons with Varia I did, did have multiple chances to play with her and uh, with we've got Ethan Agaliak uh, and James Taylor uh, Ima Reedy all of these really fantastic people um, based in Cork um, who are into early music and who are just wonderful to play with and, and up for doing all of these random projects uh, even when there isn't necessarily anything going into it so that was a really fantastic way I learned uh, and um, I found the community very open so like even when I had only been playing actually one of my first uh, slightly terrifying educational experiences was when I had had the Brock violin in hand three weeks uh, Rachel Potter came to the Cork School of Music and was giving master classes and they were like you play Brock violin play for her there. <laughs> uh, so that was exactly a bit of a baptism of fire um but again it was it was actually a really lovely experience um i i didn't even have the, the safety net of, of maria by my side for that because she happened to be in the hospital having her second child um but uh yeah it, it was really great to 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 play with people and i had a few other uh classmates um who so had sort of, sort of started to edge their way into early music at the same time as a harpsichordist who I still play with, uh, Kieran Finnegan and uh, flautist and a cellist uh, who we made a, an ensemble out of and we started playing together. Then I think that was one of my favorite things about um, when I fi finished my undergraduate, I moved to Holland uh, and I studied for, in the, the conservatory in The Hague, um, which is fantastic. And I had some really amazing teachers there as well with uh, Walter Reiter and, and Kati uh, Debrezani. But also there's so many people playing there, which was the really amazing thing. And so many people pulling obscure projects together. And uh, I think what I learned from The Hague as well was a certain amount of that just, just put it on no matter what, just whatever project is in your head, just do it. And um, because that's what people were doing. So I, you know, I was playing Stamets clarinet concertos with people, or I was playing, you know, really uh, obscure early 17th century repertoire. Uh, we all played for each other's exams at the end of the year. There wasn't really a thing of an exam with you and a compass. It was always ensembles. So, I mean, I played in my last month in The Hague, I played 28 exams, I think. Um, <laughs> So there was just, a, and you know, obviously there are opportunities for things there that you can do that you can't necessarily do in other places because there's so many people. So we did, you know, full Beethoven piano concertos with period orchestras and uh, all these sorts of things. So that was a really wonderful um, experience in collective learning, I'd say. I think the one point in uh, talking about pedagogy in terms of lesson that I found um, that I think I've brought into my own teaching now is I think um, studying early music taught me to listen in a way that I maybe hadn't learned to before. So even in, in, in terms of in kind of relatively simple things like listening for for tuning uh, when you're talking about not not equal temper tuning to, to on the violin to start listening for difference tones uh, uh and pure intervals like that um that was a really new way of of listening for me which i think was really valuable and i actually even on i mean i'm teaching m mostly modern violin and viola now but i i think it's valid for a, a lot of string players and I know a lot of quartets really enjoy sort of that that kind of listening to tuning as well so I, I teach I teach you know if they're if they're seven or eight they can still hear that I don't I don't mind teaching uh small kids that and I find listening it's a lot easier for me again I think it's a, it's a principal thing if I can listen for that quality of tones uh and um different tones and qualities of sounds to find what the just intonation is it's a lot easier than having to remember that that's exactly what a b sounds like mm -hmm. um so i think that's that's something that kind of fundamentally changed the way i i play and i teach as well is that it's particularly from uh studying with walter i think he uh really taught me to listen in a in a in a very uh very engaged way that's the sort of a wishy-washy words but in a in a very intense way actually 
it's the particulars of being in a place I think uh, uh, I've always felt the particulars of, of the setting and the intensity of time during which you get to, uh, to work on, on things often affects how we absorb them. I mean, um, there's a, a tendency sometimes we, we have two kind of streams of, of early music learning, don't we, or, or more maybe. We have the one where you're over a period of a year or two years or, so, or several years, you have constant contact with colleagues, uh, but life goes on. You have also a more intense type of period of, uh, of learning uh, where you might go to courses um, or, or special projects that have a, a learning component or an apprenticeship. Andrew, um, you uh, run uh, courses of this kind and productions of this kind, don't you? I mean, that, that bring, um, bring people into a learning scenario with professionals and those are intense time periods uh I, it would be so interesting to know what um what people feel it, it might be the the, the future uh, of of early music learning and teaching is it going to continue do you think i mean obviously um the times are strange right now but we're thinking of when we didn't all have to do things on zoom and out, out of our houses um when we go back to so the public sphere, what, what might early music be like in these coming decades? Will we go back to apprenticeships? Will we, uh, like it was in centuries ago, will we, will we continue with, um, like with early, will early music departments maybe survive is always a question. Um, should we have more? I'd just love to, to throw those questions out as well. Anyone? Andrew, I think, yeah. yep. I think um, Katrina described something very well that I've heard from students and was part of my own experience when I was studying, which is that there's a kind of critical mass of people that you have to have gathered in the same place. Um, and then, you know, this project way, project based way of learning, whether it's a project directed by um, a visiting teacher or a teacher of the institution, or it's a project that students are doing amongst themselves and finding out for themselves how to research and run a project. Um, this is extremely valuable and it's quite a different model from the standard conservatoire model, but I think it's one that fits early music very well. Mm -hmm. And what that critical mass of numbers is depends on lot of, again on which kind of repertoire you're doing. So Katrina was talking about the, 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 you know, with the large numbers you've got in one place in and around The Hague, they could, they could do um, classical orchestra with um, early instruments, fantastic. But if you're doing um, medieval music, your critical mass can actually be one or two people. Um, if you've got three, you know, wow, we're, we're into the really big repertoire now. Um, and so um, I think this project way, project based way of working um, especially if it's seen flexibly, is, is, is I, I, I think, very valuable. And I, I think it's more valuable than trying to pattern early music education after the mainstream. Right. The mainstream pattern. I mean, we were talking about that before, about, um, uh, about uh, the idea of having a mainstream conservatory training. And then, uh, oh, we're, jo we're getting a couple of more faces into the grid here. Um, welcome uh, there. There's, oh, Peter's connecting uh, some audio. Okay. Uh, we have, uh, and who else? We have Maliki there waiting. Um, Maliki, I see your hand is up. So while we're yeah. connecting, and there's Miriam, and there's Yonit's hand as well. So I'm going to go in the order that I saw them. Um, yeah. Yeah, Maliki. Yeah, I just, uh, I, I, I think that's uh, really interesting about the way that things are taught. And um, uh, very often the way things are taught these days is dependent on the way things are examined. Um, so that the system by which we evaluate our skill and our, uh, our skill as we, as we progress um, means that uh, people, children learning classical music uh, um, for, for many years now have learned exam pieces 
and they've learned scales and sight reading with a view to applying these to this big thing, the exam at the end of the year. And during the year, some pupils of some teachers don't do any pieces with any significant detail, apart from the ones that they require for their exam. Um, this has happened, uh, this has influenced, now the same system has influenced jazz um, teaching and learning now. And jazz players complain a lot. Oh, the old guys, I, I like to listen to um, a couple of jazz podcasts and the old guys say, you know, it's all these kids coming out of school now, they can play all the modes and they got all the fingers and they can play fast and, and stuff. But um, the, the problem is often that they don't have much to say. Now, I guess they're talking about kids and kids grow up and once the kids have grown up, then they've got more to say. But the, the relationship between the emphasis put on technique at the early stage and, and getting into uh, your, the language of, of, of the thing. And in fact, the, the mental business of, of assessing what am I doing here anyway? What is this and what am I trying to express? And again, this gets back to what we were saying earlier about conversation. So, uh, you know, it's, um, it's, it's part of that. Um, jazz also has a bearing on early music it, from my perspective that playing continual, which I do as a bass player, but also as a gamba player, um, is the same job as as playing jazz bass, uh, and um, and that's that's a, a, a lovely thing to to acknowledge, and that the best way to learn it, maybe the only way to learn it is to do it, um, which applies to a lot of our, as Andrew was saying as well about uh, learning from your colleagues, uh, that early music. I mean, certainly, as far as we know, double bass, which was of course a staple part of. Um, of orchestras from whenever they started having orchestras wasn't taught as a an instrument in its own right uh, to study it was a thing that people did as a second instrument even including the time when Bach was uh, in Leipzig and so on that the instrument wasn't taught as a first study instrument so the idea of having people studying baroque double bass and playing um, Vivaldi sonatas cello sonatas on it so they can do exams um, which which happens now is just to give them something that they can learn for exams, um, and it's 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 arse ways really. So, right, getting together and playing is really the only way to learn. Of course, you need to learn some technique as well, but you don't learn the music away from the playing of the music. Not really. That's that's actually a really timely place that we bring in two other um, people into the into the grid here, Peter Whelan up there. Hello, welcome Peter, director of Irish Brock Orchestra for those who are listening in and viewing on YouTube, a live stream. Uh, Miriam Kachor, flutist, we have you back uh, from our first session. Welcome back. Uh, I see uh, we have Teresa there again as well. And so welcome to you too. Um, it, it, earlier on, Teresa was telling us about her path from one uh, different schooling to another. Miriam also giving us an idea of what the kind of patchwork was like in, um, in, uh, in, in kind of putting together different experiences uh, and, and then launching into the professional world, I guess, um, uh, from, from, from all of those combined experiences in both modern and early training. Um, and Peter, I, I know that uh, the Irish Baroque Orchestra now has, uh, has I suppose, is it a, a training program, uh, the Youth Baroque Orchestra? Is that something that is, uh, has, has, has new, um, new, I suppose, blood coming into the early music scene? We, we started off this second session talking about pedagogy, where we left off our first session. So that's why we're, we're heading in this direction now. So, um, oh. Hang on. I'm not sure if your audio is working. We can't hear you. We see you talking. <laughs> we see Peter, but we don't hear. OK, no problem. Um, in the meanwhile, while you're getting that set up, um, Miriam, you were telling us uh, uh, earlier on about how it happened for you, but what, if you could change things, um, would you change how your training was? Like if you had a, a chance to do something um, different or opportunities, especially here in Ireland where we have, um, where we have 
only one, I suppose, early music department in the whole country. Doesn't mean that we don't have plenty of, of artists and early music spirit, but, um, but there's only one department, so to speak. So if we want to go by that kind of model, um, what, what things would you like to see in the future um, uh, in terms of teaching for the up and coming? Well, when I was in, in the academy, actually, um, we didn't have anything going on. There's no department. And we so whenever um, we wanted some training, we actually had to go up to the head of other departments and ask if there was a budget for bringing in a master class um, um, artist or someone. But so, yeah, it certainly would have been super helpful to have um, have like a larger network. Then Katrina actually came in. We were briefly in college together. Um, and it was it was great to have uh, someone else, but I think that just having a community of other young people is really important when you're just starting out. Because if it wasn't for two two other people um, who were in the academy studying modern instruments at the time, who were interested in in kind of getting together once a week and playing through it, I probably wouldn't have kept it up because it would have been too too lonely an affair, and um, to just be stuck in a room by by myself as much as I loved it. And um, so I think it is like something like the Irish Youth Rock Orchestra is is so important, and we see people come back every year um, to do it. And um, so, and yeah, and yet they, you just see them kind of even even. Um, turning down other other youth orchestra opportunities like wind bands and stuff to do this um this program because it's it's super encouraging mm. that that is uh, an important part of it bringing players together i mean we were just talking about the company of others i mean this is one thing that yonit and i have been trying now to conceive of with hipster that what we want to do is bring um people into the country not just for the concerts that we'd like to, to have more or performances, but then those same people can come and bring co uh, in the form of a, of a long weekend or a week uh, type of course, those kind of intensives. Um, because until there are more, the, until there's more of a, what's the word, a, a quorum, I suppose a critical mass of, of bodies doing this music uh, outside of the professional ensembles, um, then you know we'll need these kind of courses and workshops um, and also on the kind of the semi-professional level, there's also, a, I suppose, a need and an interest that's, uh, that can be filled by having uh, at, at festivals and outside of festivals, uh, a way of bringing people into the early music um, fold, even if they're not quite up to the professional level, at least this is my thinking that you may be able to sift out one or two people who then are the ones who continue onward to, to higher training not sift out in a bad sense, but rather you'll, you'll find them there. You'll be able to, to discern who's, who's there. So um, you need to, your hand is- Yeah, I was up. gonna say, there's such great interest amongst the young people here in Ireland to learn. Um, in the past year alone in this area in Limerick and in Ennis uh, nearby, we, we've done five workshops and master classes for young people. Uh, two of them were harpsichord, harpsichord for young pianists. And then we also brought in Connor Hastings to do introductory workshops and lectures, uh, one at the college level and two for younger people um, on, uh, on Cornetto. Um, so there's definitely a lot of interest and in these kids just ate this up, they asked really good questions. They were interested in music history and they want to learn. So I think that's an important um, piece of knowledge to know that that interest is there. Um, and then the other, the other bigger part is how do we get instruments <laughs> to these people who want to learn, right? So, you know, it's sort of a, a taste or some of these people have never seen a harpsichord or touched a harpsichord or a Baroque flute or a cornetto and then they touch it and then it gets taken away. <laughs> Yeah, and so, right. So um, that's an area I would really like to invest more energy in and find ways for us to fundraise in Ireland um, to bring in the instruments so that we can make and generate more energy in early music all over the country. Yeah. 
that absolutely need more of that. Um, I see welcoming Andrew Robinson back for another session and another uh, Andrew, uh, the other, our other Andrew in the group has a hand up there. Um, Andrew Lawrence King, go ahead. Well, I just want to talk a little bit about what um, we're doing in Moscow because we have a very particular situation there. We've started um, an academy, but not inside a conservatoire, but inside a theater. And um, it's a theater which is for young people. So we're already in our mainstream work at the theater. They're working with, we could say, the audience of the future. The theater director is very committed to Baroque music and in very much the way that you were just talking about, um, he's aware that you need not only professional training, but you need what he calls like an ecosystem for early music. Mm -hmm. So that there's a sort of a broad base to the pyramid. So um, you're getting children involved, you're getting young, enthusiastic musicians, not all of them, as you say, it's a professional standard, but these are the people who are, some of them are going to go professional, some of them will keep it as an interest, but all of them are part of um, a, a broad base of support um, that, that, we, that we need um, to do any of the things that we want to do. And um, very quickly, um, I mean, the situation in Russia is that early music is um, still relatively new. We've got fantastic players there, um, most of them trained in the old, old style, you know, standard mainstream Russian way of playing. That means that they've usually got fantastic technique, but a very, very different outlook on interpretation. So it's a whole new world for them. Um, and what we're trying to do is something a bit different from the conservatoire model that wouldn't work for us anyway. And so we're very much on this project-based um, model and finding ways to bring together the right number of people to do the right kind of project. But the other thing that's different about what we're doing, and this is what I wanted to emphasize and throw out as a possible new model to be looked at also in Europe, is we're taking our model from not so much the conservatoire model, but rather the model of science teaching at universities, where the, the bright young undergraduates are involved in the cutting edge research projects of their professors, and the education and the training for higher quality work and the, the, the actual cutting edge research are all connected together. And I think that's a very exciting model for early music where regardless of your technical standard, you can be involved in the latest um, historical performance practice research, new ideas, new ways of doing things. And all these new ideas need to be experimented on. Um, when we first had the idea that maybe the Monteverdi Vespers should have certain movements transposed down a fourth, well, the first thing you have to do is to try it out. And so before there was a professional tryout, um, Andrew Parrott actually was, did, did some uh, workshops with students and experimented with this theory to see how it actually goes. Um, this is, I think, the future for early music is this mixing together of research, training and performance. Mm. Absolutely. Um, for those who are uh, joining, I'm just going to give a quick point of order. Peter Whelan, you weren't here in the first session, so you might not know if you want to add anything. There's a raise hand. Uh, okay, right. <laughs> but, uh, so if can you hear me now? Does that work? Yeah. I mean, you can physically raise your hand too, but there's a raise hand button and it lets uh, you know me quietly know that I should pass the baton. Um, because that way, you know, if we, there's anyone that we haven't heard from, uh, but who would like to be heard, you can just just do so. Um, yeah, so I am keeping an eye on, on uh, different people who might be joining us throughout the rest of this hour. We're about halfway through our second session here. Um, and like I said, we're live streaming on YouTube. I'm hoping that people won't be shy and that they start sending us comments and questions because they may want to ask questions directly of all of you or one or more of you. Um, but while we're on, I don't know if anybody else has, uh, has any more to add on this uh, topic. Uh, Andrew, that, that's actually really fascinating about this academy 
model, and I hope that that there's more of this that happens around the world. It, it, it's it's kind of inspiring because it's like the uh, a return in a way to the academia of old, um, but uh, with with new with new. Uh, new additions. Yeah, uh, Andrew Robinson, I see your physical hand up there, yeah. Oh, can't hear your audio there. Can't hear you. Unmute. No, unmuted. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, no, I, I don't seem to see a, a, a virtual um, hand up button, but I, I just can't put up my hand. No, I wanted to go back to something that Katrina said which is relevant to what Andrew's just been saying. And that is the, the whole idea of um, the conservatory style that you learn. And it seems very uh, true that there is now a big consensus about how Baroque music at least should be played and also Renaissance music. And it, it brings to mind uncomfortably or comfortably, whatever way you look at it, what uh, Taruskin said, Richard Taruskin said, <clears throat> that there is now a, a kind of early music ethos which is spread all over the world. We all do it the same way. And it is the ethos of neoclassicism and Stravinsky in particular. Clear. Uh, on. Clear. <laughs> <laughs> Speedy tempos, you know, good, uh, brisk and uh, well, you know, <laughs> Well, it, it it rings. It has certain bells that ring. Bells that, that bells that ring. Well, um, I'd say that there. While you're while you were saying the the that there well Taruskin's name already brings up uh, <laughs> smiles and bells <laughs> among other things. Um, but I was thinking that um, there's. Something of something to be said about how how we can get into the danger of a of a of an edgy. Okay, let me, let me start from the beginning. When things begin as a movement, I'm now going to take step out of early music and talk about movements. It seems that when things begin as nascent movements, they have a kind of an edginess that they push against uh, a, a center or a mainstream, and then sometimes as they become better known or, or more people become interested in it. And sometimes as people's uh, lives change and they still have those interests, they, they bring a, a, a roundedness of the edge, so to speak. Things that were once edgy become a little less so and they enter a sort of mainstream. So is this, I wonder what's, what uh, Taruskin was talking about as well or not? Um, mm -hmm. or, or is it something else? Yeah, you and me. Yeah. Um, so I, I see this trend um, as I've seen it in period instrument ensembles as well as modern instrument ensembles. And um, both individuals and directors and uh, ensemble players, I think a lot of musicians don't take the time to make decisions for themselves artistically and do their own research. And so people hear a trend and they copy it. It's that simple sure. without yeah. knowing why they're playing that tempo or why they're playing yeah. that, um, uh, that ornament that way. And so you get a lot of sameness. And so that edginess yeah. and that originality and that creativity is at the risk yeah. of being lost. Um, and I think it's also part of this fast paced uh, society that we're living in. And a lot of organizations feel under pressure to rehearse in very short amounts of time. They have limited budgets and they want to get music out there. And everybody's trying to be as stylistic as possible. Sure. Um, yeah. I would, love, but, I, mean, I, I would love for everybody to get back to having time. I don't know if we ever had this time. I would love to get to a, a place where money aside, we really had time to explore and research the repertoire, which we did when we were, I, I did when I was a student. So much more time to really contemplate and experiment yeah. um, in ways that uh, in professional life, we don't usually have as much time to experiment, try it this way or try it that yeah. way. Um, 
but it's those concepts that are important uh, yeah. and disseminating whether you're a modern player or you're a period instrument player so that we can actually make those informed decisions and, sure. and not all sound like copycats with the same yeah. time. Well, no, I take your point that, that um, you know, a trend will spread and we'll all pick it up. But it's what Katrina was saying first, that she was attracted to the feeling that you could do your own uh, interpretation. You could, you could be yourself uh, in early music in ways that you couldn't in conservatory classical music. And I'm just echoing Taruskin's feeling that uh, it's not really like that anymore, that there are people who have done the research and they say, this is how it's done and everybody does it that way. Yeah, okay, the research is going no. on, but we're all, we're all behaving in a way that is very, what Maliki called, their names. what, what Maliki called um, military obedience, military, military grade obedience. Military <laughs> obedience, yeah, and, yeah. Yeah, and uh, the, the, the thing, that if you look at contemporary music, right? People uh, putting out songs and uh, people putting out compositions, they kind of don't go for the tidy edges that we classical musicians, if we call ourselves that, go for, tidiness, you know? That they like things that sort of trail off and that go off pitch and that go this way and that way and have bits of extra noise in them and things like that. Um, we just don't accept because it's not part of the conservatory tradition and that's what we're in. Hmm. Yes, I see, uh, I, I see two hands, even more than one there from, from Andrew uh, Florence King. Um, are they just cries of, of worry and disgust or, or something or, or did you want to add to it also, Andrew? I just want to say that I don't buy the Tarskin thing and I, I I, there is certainly a sameness in established early music, but I certainly don't buy that it's based on historical evidence. It's based on people copying each other's CDs. Yeah, and right. the first thing we teach our students is the difference between a primary source and a secondary source. And a CD, even the CD you love, even the CD by a superstar, those CDs are not primary sources. And so some of us are still reading primary sources and finding things which shock us and completely rip up the today's consensus in early music. And some of us are arguing for that and are experimenting with it and trying it. Um, I think there is of course a pressure to consensus. There, you know, there are all kinds of reasons, lack of time, uh, people not wanting to frighten the audience, but, um, that's not the fault of early music. It's a general thing in society. Mm. And there's plenty of room for the people who are willing to try some rough edges. Um, and I think that's one of the things that we should be doing in our education. The first thing we should be telling people is don't listen to CDs. Mm. We listen to fun, <laughs> listen to pleasure, but not information. <laughs> unless, unless Andrew Robinson, unless you've got yeah. that CD of William Byrd himself playing from the Fitzwilliam Virginals book. I want a copy, uh, but otherwise not CDs. <laughs> yeah, well, no, hooray for that and uh, bravo. But uh, the, uh, the, the message was really just that uh, there, I've forgotten what the message is. <laughs> we're, we're doing, yes, we're doing um, military grade obedience is, is the message. <laughs> Yeah, and, and where it's coming from could be uh, could be the the topic of the uh, um, uh, hey, or, or a discussion. Um, it, it would be great to hear from some of the folks who we haven't heard from uh, much so far or or uh, in a while. So if if Miriam or Teresa or Peter, if any of you would like to to add, Peter. Sure. Can you can you hear me now? Does that now we can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. I was just thinking about what you're saying. I, find, I dug out this book, the, the End of Early Music, this Haynes book, which is a great book. call to arms to uh, for how we should maybe reassess how to do things. It's yeah. nice um, having that contact with, with somebody who's there kind of at the beginning and showing a bit of disappointment how things were taken up um, uh, and now uh, how we might ruffle some feathers all over again. I, I find it really fascinating watching the, like the, even the Monroe videos of, I, I don't know what, what decade they were made, but 
there were so many different aspects of early music that they were taking and sampling were full of passion. And um, it's funny that the, the, the narrow windows that we, we've pursued over the years, we have this very um, safe and standard forms of, uh, or to generalize a lot, let's say Handel and Bach, there's they're, they're, a way you would expect a, say a British orchestra to perform those. But there's lots of room, um, yeah, as you say, to, to get people thinking and, um, I guess with the with the Irish Baroque uh, Orchestra, we've been doing a lot of work with 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 composers um, who've got something to do with Ireland. So it's it's about connecting um, music to place and to characters and that kind of uh, individual uh, um, history. Actually, another great book. Sorry to be boring you with my library, but uh, this this Sam Owens, the well-travelled musician. I don't know if you know this one. It's um, the handbook of, um, of Kusser, who's in, in Dublin, and there's so much there. In my, in my isolation, I'm studying this and finding out all of the names of the tradesmen in Dublin and, and all, the, all the, the ephemera to do with music, who you'd have to pay at what theatre. And I find that, that um, from having played a very standard repertoire in year, for years in orchestras, that this is the way forward for, for me, at least to get my imagination going and a different way to connect. But of course, uh, even within our performance practice, there's lots of things that, that you read and are totally shocking. And you say, well, we're not doing that at all. And also then hugely contradictory things. And what do you do with that kind of information? So at the end, you just have to make your, your best uh, uh, choice and then make the music speak for who you're, you're speaking to and for yourself. I thought that's why the Bruce Haynes book, I thought was really, really great. Lots of inspiration there. And a nice kind of um, rebel and um, hippie spirit coming, coming through the pages. So yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Actually, the, this um, time that we all have to spend in our own uh, little dens is a good one for catching up on sources, on reading, on anything that uh, we often don't have the time to do during the rat race um, as much or maybe as much as we'd like to. So um, I, it, I'm interested in, in uh, knowing from uh, uh, maybe Teresa or, uh, or Miriam, um, with your various paths that you took um, to get here. Um, I don't know if I, I see any hands raised, but I might just, being the chair, I might just call on people and ask uh, <laughs> if there, if, was there a chance to delve into um, source material in a way that makes you feel like, you, it, like it truly informs what you do? Or have you had to rely on the interpretation of source material through the eyes, ears, and brain of another colleague or a professor? This is something that's that, that's interesting to me because I spent some time in early music courses and then a lot of time not, and a lot of time in, in conservatory. So I'm also kind of in a funny place myself, but it, the question of how much time do you like to, have you been able to, and would you like to spend with source material um, or, or the things that inform these decisions? Anyone? Uh, but uh, Teresa, if I heard yeah, it Yeah, right. sorry, I've, I've not got the screen thing on, I'll turn the video on. That's all right, we can do Yeah, it. here we oh, go, yeah. yeah. Um, so when I was studying in Utrecht Conservatorium, well, we did have historical documentation classes with Leo Mylink. And um, what we used to do um, sometimes on a, a once in two months basis, we used to uh, go through to The Hague, Royal Conservatory The Hague, and we used to attend some of their um, classes. So there was like Peter van Hagen was giving um, various um, courses um, and uh, so a few of them, myself and a few of my colleagues used to go through to the Royal Conservatory The Hague and there was also some uh, courses in uh, Amsterdam we used to go through to the block in the recorder block in Amsterdam like once a month to um, that was more practical though so that would have been less about sources and more about viewing the teaching of Walter van Hauer and Paul Lanehout who was teaching there at the time um, but I just said my experience of Utrecht was I got, um, I'd say in some ways more, that was music, I think that was the emphasis of the, um, that conservatorium in the late 90s. I got more input really from following um, classes with the different teachers and master classes on interpretation um, rather than actually being involved in studying um, in depth and a lot of sources myself. So I'd sort of said that 
um, yeah, it was very much about the practical, um, the practical lessons and classes. Yeah, it's it, it's something that um, that I wish that there was a way. I mean, we have to all recognize that if you are confronted with a source and it's not something that you're yet comfortable with, um, and and I remember this from a, a seminar I gave not too long ago uh, in Jerusalem that. It, there's always this feeling that early music police will come and get you um, if you don't have control of the sources. And, uh, and it's, it, it made me think, well, okay, well, number one, is there such a thing as the early music police? What form do they take? Um, yes, the, yes, I know them. You know them, yeah. <laughs> in the imagination <laughs> of people who <laughs> don't have the familiarity with sources, there is absolutely a fear that they may be wrong. There's the, that imposter syndrome we always uh, refer to in, in, uh, in hiding um, or amongst ourselves. And there's that idea that um, if you have someone perhaps to help guide you, or at least I think if you have someone who can initiate you into working with sources, but who won't completely influence more thinking to the extent that, that it's actually their opinion that you're absorbing rather than material from the sources as someone who can be a helpful navigator that's kind of the the idea that would be a wonderful thing to have for all of our students yes you meet you have a can i jump in and yeah, say something about absolutely. sources yeah i think you know for those of us who teach on faculties at universities um and we're collaborating with our colleagues that there needs to be um this collective desire to share in our education, educating our students and um, not have so much territoriality um, of different types of, of, of educating, you know, modern, modern music versus uh, early music. Um, there can be a resistance to setting sources and an association with sources being something for the non-performers. Um, and that's something that the musicologists do, right? Um, and so this idea of a scholarly performer, um, I think is a fairly new concept. Um, and it's not the conservatory model. It's definitely embedded in those of us who have gone through early music departments of Indiana and in The Hague and in Basel um, and, and other places as well. I'm not yet seeing it so much um, embedded in the modern music uh, conservatory model. Um, so I see a lot of students who may be very talented um, players, but they want really quick answers. And so there needs to be an infrastructure in the university model um, that allows for students to take the time to study the sources and not have it be viewed as something that's taking away from their their precious practice time. It needs to be viewed as something that is actually essential and integral to being informed, convincing performers. As, as normal as translating your words for a singer or Absolutely. putting in your bowings or, or whatever. Uh, it's a vital part of that process. But, um, yeah. Um, so as we as we head into these last ten minutes or so of the hour, uh, I mean, time time flies when we we have fun, um, and so I, I'd love to welcome any uh, other questions and ideas uh, from people. It seems like the uh, the interwebs are quiet, um, so we can talk amongst ourselves and let folks uh, listen in. Peter, I saw your hand fly up. Uh, Miriam, yes. does your hand fly up afterwards? Uh, oh, just something that occurred to me there. I don't know if, if, if how many of you were at um, a, um, a talk given um, by uh, was it Lawrence Dreyfus at the Academy a few years ago about using different kinds of sources, um, which I find really inspiring and fascinating because there comes a point with certain kinds of music, for instance, coming from bassoon, there's not that much written or you, you kind of end up... Uh, searching for for lots of different uh or it's just it's just it's just hard work but he suggested certain certain kinds of repertoire um you can um take and especially earlier repertoire you can take inspiration from things like paintings and poetry um and that can be just as useful because sometimes the people who are writing uh, um uh, about theory of music they're maybe at a different part of their life they might not be able to performing the stage it might have been 
you know, 50 years ago that they were actually at, at the coal face performing. So it, it, you maybe have to, to, to take what they say with a, a, a pinch of salt. But things like poetry and, and paintings from the time uh, to do with imagery, there were much more uh, uh, cross relation between those, the, all the different kinds of art. And I find that if you run out of ideas or, or run out of um, sources, that, that, that's just another really um, fruitful place you can go to look for, for inspiration for all kinds of uh, music and musical ideas. Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. Um, Miriam, I can't tell if that's your hand going up or if maybe you were doing something on a keyboard. <laughs> so, but could you add if you wanted to say uh, anything? I'm, I'm definitely quite a bit younger than everyone here, so I still have a really long way to go in terms of I haven't had maybe that much time to to delve into all the research and everything and but do have a lot of ideas kind of um, sparking up but um having like done that kind of by myself and started off by myself I um I went and did a course in in Toronto ran by the Tafamuti Orchestra mm -hmm. and they yeah. got such a brilliant sort of um, autonomy developed there with like you know the performers also being the librarians and um, and the you know preparing their own editions and everything and and they ran daily um, classes and it, for me it was brilliant actually I know you shouldn't rely on on um, other people's interpretations but it was brilliant to see some of these things through someone else's um, eyes and um, with someone else's experience as well um, and especially it coming from a performer as well and I think for a lot of the young people there who are all at different um, stages of kind of exploring their early music um, passion they um, it, it was great to see the excitement and everything because sometimes it can be quite alien kind of approaching something written strictly by a musicologist or not written but presented and um, and so, so I think maybe like just um, for me representing the younger, younger um, or, or fresher, um, not fresher. I'm not. <laughs> I'm taking a hole here. No, but a less experienced side of um, of of the the profession here. So it's important to hear that voice, though, Miriam, because that's where we that that's kind of where we need to put our efforts of understanding to help um, people who want to know, but who feel that there's just something that stands slightly in the way of getting to the information or accessing or interpreting and understanding the information. So this is where this idea of navigating, of being, a, of it being having a system of helpful navigators, experienced people who have a handle on the sources and how to employ the sources and then those who are eager to know more, but just don't have the time spent with the sources and, uh, and interpreting them and being able, how do you reach the point, like what Yonit said, to make the decision for yourself? You have to get a chance to, um, to, to imbibe that source in a way that, that's, uh, that, that meets you kind of where you are and brings you to your next step. It's like learning to swim. Well, Half of it is getting to the sea or to the pool, uh, and then the other half is getting into the water. And uh, and I guess there are more halves than this because then the next half is actually wading out into the water. So there are all these steps, and if we can bring people along each uh, each part of it uh, out of of this journey, then I think we're we're doing a great service to incoming generations. That you know we're continuously passing torches to one another. It's not just one torch from one generation to another. We have all these batons we're, we're handing over to one another. Yeah, uh, Andrew Lawrence King, and I saw your hand fly up. Thanks, Miriam. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, of course, there's a value in both kinds of teaching. Um, we need the kind of teaching which sends students to sources to answer questions for themselves. Um, and, uh, there are always, even in early music, there are questions that we can't answer from the sources, either because we as a teacher um, don't know of the source or perhaps the information simply isn't available. And so I think one of the things as a, as a good teacher, you have to be prepared to say is, I don't know. Um, I don't know of a source. Here is where I might think to look. Um, 
I don't know from the sources. This is what I can tell you from my experience. This is what a lot of us do. But here, this is where we have to be absolutely disciplined as teachers and as directors, which is that we make it clear at every stage, I'm telling you this because it comes from this source. Check it for yourself. Or I'm telling you this because it comes from my experience or an intelligent guess. And both are valuable, but we do need to separate them. And I think one of the problems for um, uh, the kind of project teaching that we, we were very enthusiastic about at the beginning of this um, discussion, one of the dangers for it is that students pick up a lot of things secondhand and they have no way of knowing. I've got a lot, whole lot of impressions in my head, but which of those impressions are source-based and which are just a nice idea from this famous and inspiring director. Both those things are good, but we do need to keep them separate. Here, here. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's, that's a very, very good point to make because there is a lot of uh, one thing um, not masquerading, but sometimes being confused with or passed off as the other. Um, and uh, and uh, whether, and it's usually, I mean, the road to hell is paved with good intentions in a way, <laughs> so, you know, so we often, um, we do things because it's, uh, uh, how many times have we heard, you know, a student um, say, but this, this is how I heard it done. And how many books have we, have we read where, where the movement, the early music movement is accused of all sounding the same because they're all copying the one model. Now we're going back to that same question we started the hour with, which is, okay, the way to avoid that perhaps then is being, as you said, disciplined about how we, um, how we behave with uh, passing on of this knowledge. So, um, so that's, that's a fantastic, um, that's actually a really great way to kind of descend into the, um, the last few minutes here that we have together. I have to say, this has been really fun to have all of you in, a, in the same virtual room um, for different periods of time, but especially during these two hours here. People have been uh, watching and viewing on, uh, on the internet. I can see that. They just, I think, have been a little bit shy of asking questions, but um, hopefully they'll enjoy what we'll have said here and talked about, and um, more people may see uh, this throughout Early Music Day. Um, so if uh, any parting thoughts as we, as we return to our, our merry way um, in, in our various places of seclusion. Hello, Maliki, a hand has gone up. Yes. Um, I, I just want to say something uh, on behalf. I, I think Andrew, Andrew Lawrence King's idea of, um, you mentioned uh, music being taught as research, training and performance, uh, and that um, those who um, have a who may not be uh, most skilled performers, but who could have um, valuable, uh, maybe very valuable uh, con contributions in research. I think that you have to be careful as well to allow for um, people whose uh, inclination or time constraints uh, make them more inclined to do less research and to leave the research to people. And I'm speaking, I admit I'm speaking for myself here. I grew up in a house with Andrew down there, and, yeah. <laughs> and uh, the, the, he had a lot of answers to things, and I didn't have to look very far for them. And I've played a lot of music with people who have uh, enormous appetite for um, reading material and the time to do it. Um, and I've also played with people who uh, have very strong opinions, and there's no point arguing with them, even though they might be not, not correct. So, uh, so you make you make uh, you bring what you want to bring and what you can bring, and it just that the whole discussion here has looked a bit like you wouldn't be a credible early musician without reinventing the wheel every time. I know that's not what any of you mean, but I just want to put that out there for any listener who might be put off by all of this that it's okay to uh, it's okay to. Uh, learn from people whose research is scrupulous without having to go and redo all that research yourself. Uh, and it's okay to put your main effort, effort into performing. I think that's worth saying, right? I, I think it is, yeah, worth saying. And I think probably wouldn't disagree with you. Um, Andrew uh, Lawrence King, did you, did you want to um, make a mention of something there as well? 
Yeah, just very quickly, and this is perhaps dangerous, especially in the uh, in the context of the isle, island of Ireland. But I will go out on a limb here and say that quite seriously, what we're looking at here is something of the difference between a Catholic perspective and a Protestant perspective, <laughs> um, in the sense that Catholics are brought up in their church to believe the dogma and Protestants are brought up to challenge everything and find their own way to salvation. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I, I leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially with the very bag of, of, uh, of people that you have um, here with their own strange but there, there variety. A point. But, but, yeah, yeah, right. Um, but we're just here to cause trouble, don't you know. <laughs> but perhaps the serious point is that our, yeah. our early music movement does owe a lot to um, the Protestant countries and to um, to Bible scholarship, which is the root of um, musicological text work. Um, it's still based on those things with Bible studies and that's why we've got this kind of sanctity of our Ur edition and all those kind of things. Yeah. So it's I amazing. think these deep seated yeah. cultural attitudes do of course influence the way we make music. Yeah, I, I mean, if I, if I understand what, you, what you're saying, uh, that it's uh, the matrix from whence it springs and therefore it's important to understand the matrix uh, because, I mean, it, sure, we have to admit how much influence um, that world, that sound world, that thought world had in the nascent early music revival. Um, obviously, uh, we're not talking about superficial um, comparisons here for anyone who is listening and, and would get confused by that analogy. But yeah, it's a really, really interesting point um, to, to make. Uh, I like the, what, the mention that Maliki uh, made just now uh, of how there are people who will, for time constraints or other reasons, uh, be the ones who leave more of the detailed research um, to those who have the time or the ability, the desire. But at the same time, we are also in this together, which is the other great part. Um, that's one of those buzzwords for this time, uh, that these strange times that we live in. But if we are all in it together, it means that we all can share different aspects of this load, I think. Um, some of us take on one job and others take on a, a diversity of other jobs. In between all of it, if we share what we have and what we do and what we know, I think that we come out the richer, that's for sure. So um, that's, that's one thing that I think, if anything, has beautifully come out of this uh, meeting of a few uh, wonderful friends and, uh, and acquaintances that I, I'm really happy to have hosted uh, online and uh, each of you in your own homes. I hope that you all stay healthy and well, and um, we can always continue these discussions online as well. So I encourage anybody who's watching out uh, to, on the internet and uh, through our different streams to send their comments, their questions, and I'm sure that we'll all be able to, in the times that come ahead, to answer them in whichever way possible um, through, through commentary or email. Uh, thank you all for joining in, each and every one of you, for your time. And um, I hope that we stay in contact over these next weeks, months, and so on. Thanks, Vlad. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye. Stay Bye. 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 Cheers.